hey, you can read, that's great. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, who does instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by that same spirit to be made truly wise, and to ever rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of Fatima, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I want to begin this conference talk by especially speaking about the importance of grace, God's grace. We cannot underestimate the importance of God's grace in our life. God's grace enlightens our minds. It strengthens our will to know and to do God's will. And I really believe that in the world today, God's grace is active. We see this so often with so many souls now realizing what's happened within the church and coming back to the Latin mass traditional faith. But I find it interesting at how many of them are so enthusiastic about spreading the faith and they're so eager and then I get a call from them saying, I'm really disappointed. People are not interested on what we have to say or what we're talking about. I give them literature and they say, oh, thank you very much. They don't read it. And they come across uh, a lot of indifference. And I try to tell them, you know, if you stop and think of the time when Christ walked this earth visibly amongst men, it was the same thing. Every mass, at the end of the mass, we recite the last gospel, the first chapter of St. John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, etc. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. I just have to tell you, I find it absolutely amazing for how many centuries did God's chosen people, the Israelites, await a Messiah. They prayed, they longed for the coming of the Messiah, and when he finally comes, they rejected him. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And I have to tell you this, of all people who should have recognized Jesus Christ as the Messiah, it should have been the scribes and the Pharisees. They knew sacred scripture very well. They knew the prophecies. And not only was our Lord fulfilling prophecy, but he was also working miracles publicly in front of everyone. Miracles that you could not deny. And what spiritual blindness there was that they couldn't see. Now I think we, in the year 2023, can see that same spiritual blindness. It's interesting how the church, the mystical body of Christ, parallels the life of Christ. And just like in the time of our Lord, his most bitter enemies were the very ones who should have recognized him as the Messiah, the Pharisees, the scribes, the high priests. So in our own time, the church, the Catholic church, the mystical body of Christ, we are opposed more than anyone else in the world by the modern hierarchy. You can be a Protestant, you can be a non-Christian, whether it be a Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, anything, and you're a separated brother. You're a part of the people of God, as they say. But don't you dare be a traditional Catholic. And I, I always have to, let's, I don't laugh, I smile, when people don't realize this and they experience it for the first time. We had a friend and parishioner around the Columbus area, Columbus, Nebraska, and uh, he passed away. So we're gonna have the rosary, and the next day have the funeral and the burial. After the rosary, his name was Spichka. Remember the Spichkas? Maybe you heard the name. He knew your, your, your folks. But uh, poor Adeline Spichka, 
she comes to the rosary and after the rosary we she and I get called back to the office for the funeral director and he said listen never seen this before ever but we just got a call from the local priest and he got a call from the diocese and the diocese said that Frank cannot be buried in the family plot now they've had this plot for years the man Frank Spitzka was probably close to 90 years old long and short of it is they said you have to have him buried outside the cemetery in another place where the non-Catholics or unbaptized are. And, and the funeral director told me, he said, this is so much nonsense because I know we have buried non-Catholics in the cemetery before. So this is just, he said, I don't understand. I says, no, I understand exactly. I said, if you're not a Catholic, you wouldn't understand, but we represent the Catholic faith the way it used to be practiced and believed and they don't anymore. And, the, and everyone's okay except for if you're a traditional Catholic. So Adeline was like, what do I do, Bishop? And, you know, I'm not sure. And I said, listen, if you were younger, I'd tell you, sue them. But, you know, you want to get this over. You just want to have closure. So I just remember we went to the cemetery, and they had already dug the grave where it was supposed to be with the other relatives. And they had these big fellows like this standing like, come on and try to bury him here. And we just drove by and we buried them and I said, Addie, don't even worry about it. Just, just let's let it go. Not important in a sense that, you know, he got the Latin mass, he got a Catholic burial, he was spiritually prepared. You, you, what can you ask for more? It's not going to matter because at the end of the world he's going to rise again and he won't need that place anyway. We had recently another situation, this is an example. I think many of you have heard me talk when we travel around the country about Malachi Miller. This boy about 12 years old, he had cancer. Uh, when he died, they were in a small town of about 300 people, and the community had really rallied behind the mom because she had lost her husband five years earlier, now lost her 12-year-old. And when they were making arrangements, one of the close family friends said, hey, you can certainly use the local church here. They let the Protestants use it all the time. So she texted, and I was thinking back, mine, they're not going to let you use it. I just, no, don't, no, whatever. So this woman was very certain, telling the mom, Jenna Miller, don't worry, it's for sure. Just count on it. That afternoon, she calls back, and she's sobbing. I don't know what this uh, doesn't make any sense. They said, you can't use it. And Jenna was just trying to calm her down and say, that's OK. We'll have the funeral and the mass and things in the community center. We did it when my husband passed away. We'd do it for, for Malachi. But what the woman couldn't understand, who was the Nova Sordo woman, she couldn't understand, how could this be? I mean, you're Catholic. You go by the term Catholic. And although you're not maybe a part of the diocese or whatever, I mean, you're probably, in the woman's thinking, you're probably a lot closer than the Protestants, and they'll let the Protestants use it all the time. No surprise. Because you could be anything, but don't be traditional Catholic. I find it interesting that when we think of the past 65 years, I find a parallel between what was happening in our country and what's happened in the church. Now, I, I'm sure many of you this is breaking to the choir. Many of you know our country is being betrayed from within. It's very disheartening. We don't even recognize our country anymore. What have they done? It's, it's happened, it's being betrayed from the top and it's happening from within. By executive order, we have what we call borders and we have walls to keep people from coming into the country illegally. Now, why is that? It's, of course, because, number one, we want to, we want to vet people, we want to know who's coming in. We don't want criminals or, or drug cartels or terrorists coming into our country. Not only that, but our country can only sustain, can only handle so many people. That's why every year we've been taking in, legally, at least a million people. But we gradually introduce them into the system so they're not overwhelming our schools, our hospitals, 
and we don't have enough room and enough facilities for all of them. And within the last, what, two and a half, three years, with open borders, they're overwhelming our system, and they're bringing in drugs. And we had a, a tragedy. It was last, uh, last year at the end of summer. I had a wedding in uh, Colorado, and uh, the family had a very tragedy at the time of the wedding. They had a handicapped daughter, and sh she was you know, subject to seizures, and when she was sleeping, she had a seizure and she suffocated. And the mother was dealing with, you know, the loss of her, her child. It just, it was so unexpected. And then right before their wedding, the family wedding. So I was talking to one of the close relatives, and she said that, you know, the mother went to some type of a, a retreat for grieving mothers that lose a child. When she came back, she said, I was really amazed. There was 20 of us there, 20 mothers that were there that lost children. If I'm not mistaken, I think she said most of them, most of those grieving mothers lost their children to fentanyl. That their children got onto some, like they're gonna smoke marijuana, but it was laced with fentanyl. Most of them, most of their children died through a, a drug overdose. We also know, we mentioned in the sermon, if you were awake, I know sometimes people sleep during a sermon, but we're $33 trillion in debt and we're spending money like galore the devaluation of the dollar. I, I have to laugh when I'm having class with our high school talking about what things cost when I was a kid. So you can kind of date this, but I remember when gasoline was 29 cents a gallon. How many remember that earlier than me? Or more, or, yeah, or less than that. How many remember less than 29 cents? What was it? 26 cents. Oh, 26 cents. <laughs> You're really old, Dave. <laughs> Anybody beat, anybody beat 26? I don't believe it. No. <laughs> 19 cents. And now what, what, three fifty four dollars a gallon? If you're from California, uh, California. Six twenty nine. okay. But also, the, the, to me, the more tragic situation is the destruction of our youth. And when we talk about destruction of our youth, <clears throat> our kids, our youth are being brainwashed through social media, the internet, entertainment, in their own public schools. A lot of the public schools have been basically taken over, I'm not saying everywhere and everyone. You want to be careful that you make a universal statement, but many of the schools have been taken over. Kids are being taught to question their own gender, Oh, are you sure you're this? Are you sure you're that? And we'll help you, but we won't tell your parents. What an undermining of parental authority. We have a, a woman in our parish. She's a substitute teacher. She's actually a refugee from communist Cuba. And she said, Bishop, you're not going to believe it. I go to substitute for high school classes, and they have posters of known communists that they're holding up as these great social reformers. What an absolute positive lie. So, you know, we can go on and on and on what's going on in our country. It makes us sick. But we have to realize that what's, happened in our, what's happening in our country now, the same thing has happened within the church. I grew up in the 60s. And I just remember the changes. They were so one after the other and so subtle. Very confusing times. What is going on? Just like our country's being betrayed from the top, from within, the Masons, they knew to destroy the Catholic Church, they'd have to infiltrate from within. And that's the reason why there's absolutely positively no doubt in my mind, and there shouldn't be any doubt in your mind, that the modern hierarchy, they no longer represent the Catholic hierarchy. They can't. And you know, they, there's a saying, keep it, super, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, I'd like to do that and just to show you very briefly. When Christ spoke to his apostles before he ascended into heaven, he said to them, Matthew 28, 19, go teach all nations, teaching to deserve everything I've commanded you, and I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world.
What's interesting is when a bishop is consecrated, if you ever attended a consecration ceremony, before they have the imposition of hands and they have the preface with the form for consecration, they open up the book of Gospels and put it on the bishop's shoulder, showing that that's his responsibility, that's his burden, to teach all nations all things whatsoever Christ commanded. Christ promised to his apostles, I will be with you all days, even to the end of the world. If you com can just imagine this, for those traditional Catholics who are still trying to cling on to the modern hierarchy, Francis is supposedly the Pope and the bishops and cardinals under him are both all Catholic. How do you explain, how do they explain that Christ is with them as their quote unquote teaching? That would be like saying Christ has failed the church. That Christ is not in control and he's not protecting the church and that all of this could happen and Christ is present there. That is not possible. Our Lord also said to his apostles, he who hears you, hears me. Can we say this of the modern hierarchy? Absolutely not. I'd like to share with you how beautiful it is when we study our Catholic faith to see the consistency down through the centuries. We have There's a book called The Sources of Catholic Dogma. We've spoken about this in the past. It's in this bookstore for sale. And it has the major teachings of the church from the popes. It goes first starts off with Pope St. Clement the first in 90 AD all the way to Pope Pius the 12th. Plus it has the 20 ecumenical councils of the church. It is an excellent source for knowing what the Catholic Church has taught. What's amazing, if I were to read maybe Pope Clement I or another pope here, another pope there, there might be hundreds of years between them. And the amazing thing is, it sounds like the same person wrote it. It's clear, it's concise, quotes from scripture, quotes from the early fathers of the church who received the faith from the apostles. There's consistency there. There's no contradiction. There's, you know, this unanimity of, uh, of teaching. There's no contradictions between them. And then you come to Vatican II, and we see a stark break with the past contradicting what the church has taught in the past. Now, I know that uh, our times are difficult, but it's not like God has not helped us in these times. Before Vatican II, we had some very saintly popes who had the knowledge of what was happening within the church to give us all the tools that we need to be able to know and recognize the church from a false church. So I'm going to give you a couple of the references because these are all in the bookstore. First one is a syllabus of error. This was written by Pope Pius IX. So Pope Pius IX, what he did is he wrote 32 different papal addresses, uh, encyclicals, allocutions, briefs, letters, this and that, condemning the errors of his time, the modern errors that were happening at that time. The amazing thing is that the Pope was concerned maybe not all of these encyclicals and writings have gotten to everyone. So he made a compendium of the syllabus of errors. These are all, he, he, he just makes the, these are all condemned propositions. There's 70, I think 78 condemned propositions. So after the condemned proposition 
have in parentheses the particular papal address that you can make reference to finding that. And very clearly, amongst these errors that Pope Pius IX condemned, he condemned religious indifferentism. The erroneous belief that it doesn't matter. One religion is as good as another. They're all good and praiseworthy. He condemned that. He also condemned religious liberty, that man has the right to worship God any way he wants. And, and I have to say this, at Vatican II, when the topic of religious liberty came up, dignitatis humanae, the conservative cardinals and bishops are saying, how can we now teach what's been already condemned in the syllabus of error? And I know maybe some of you have not maybe heard my conference talks in the past, but there was a fellow from the John Paul II Institute back east who came to Omaha to convert me. And, uh, you know, it's just getting a little bit frustrating because he was a type of bullheaded, stubborn fellow who would not admit to anything. So if I made a point, he would not say anything. He just, he just tried to find another topic. So I said, okay, enough. So I pulled out the book, The Sources of Catholic Dogma, Denginger. I opened up the syllabus of error. I said, okay, here's the condemnation of religious liberty right here. Here is Vatican II, the documents of Vatican II. We go to Dignitatis Humanae, it's right here. So Vatican II says this. This is a condemned proposition, yes or no. And he looked, and he stared, and he looked, and he stared. <clears throat> then he kind of said, I want to read it in the original Latin. OK, fine. That was his escape. And then a little later on, I said, did you read the original Latin? He said, yes. I said, so what did I say? He said the same thing. But he would not, he would, he would, he, he's the type of person that would not concede to anything. Even if you, you caught him in a direct you know, matter that he couldn't argue against and he was wrong, he, he still wouldn't admit to it. So we have Pope Pius the Ninth, Syllabus of Error. We also have to have, have, to have after him Pope Leo the Thirteenth. And these are things that, like I said, are in the, in the bookstore here. But Pope Leo the Thirteenth, he wrote an encyclical on liberty, libertas, about what true liberty is. That we as creatures, God created us, God has established laws for us to abide by. God gave us all the natural law, knowledge of right and wrong. We can't go against a natural law. We can't go against the positive laws that God has given us through divine revelation. And those who are saying we want to have complete freedom and independence from God's law, that's nothing but slavery to vice and sin. But also, Pope Leo XIII, he addressed an issue that I believe is very providential for us, apostolice curiae. The question about Anglican orders. To make a long story short, we know Henry VIII in 1534 broke with the Catholic Church because he couldn't get a divorce with remarriage. He said he was the head of the church in England. He brought the Church of England into schism. He died, and his son, Edward VI, Edward VI was a sickly little boy, and he had advisors around him, especially Cramner, who was very Protestant. And it was under Cramner that the Church of England lost apostolic succession. Cramner had changed the right of ordination of priests and changed the right of consecration of bishops. All of the Anglican bishops were their lineage, the the bishops that when they first broke, they were valid bishops, but from them, their lineage came down to one man, Matthew Parker. And he was supposedly consecrated with this new Edwardian rite, which was ambiguous. Pope Leo XIII in Apostolice Curie, he comes up with the sacramental theology very clear. Same thing with St. Thomas Aquinas. Christ, when he instituted the sacraments, they are outward signs of invisible grace. The signs signify the grace is given. Now, the signs are made up of a matter and a form. The matter of itself is indeterminate, but the form, the words, determine the use of the matter. Now, what's your name here? You don't have a main tag. Dominic? Dominic? Yes. Okay, if I took water and threw it in his face, 
I could be trying to tell him, Dominic, wake up. <laughs> or I can just be, I don't like Dominic. I'm going to splash water in his face. Or I can pour water on Dominic and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Right? So when I throw the water on you, you're like, what is he doing? What's the bishop doing? Is it strange, kind of crazy, whatever? <clears throat> no. The form determines the matter. And so the question came about, a reconsideration of what the church had already determined that they had no valid orders. Pope Leo XIII and his apostolic constitution said the Anglicans do not have valid orders. It's interesting that this came up because it's using this apostolic constitution that we have the principles that the very things that the Anglicans did in England were the very thing is that Paul VI did in 1968. So everybody, you know, for the most part, with the Novus Ordo, 1969, they destroyed the Mass, etc. And it wasn't until a little bit later that people say, wait a minute, Paul VI changed the form for the consecration of bishops. And very similar to what the Anglicans did, Paul VI rendered the form ambiguous. It's not only expressing the grace is given in the sacrament, but also the power that is given and what particular power you're getting. If you look at the Eastern Catholic rites and the Roman Catholic rite, we find very clearly delineated the power of the episcopacy, or as in the Latin rite, the fullness of the priesthood, which is the episcopacy. But Paul VI changed that. So when we look at Apostolic Curie, providentially, we can say the Pope has already spoken on this matter. Now we go to St. Pius X. Now we're not covering everything. These, these popes have written many, many encyclicals. They're, to me, they're treasuries of the Catholic faith. We have Pope St. Pius X. And what he's especially noted for is Pascendi his condemnation of modernism. And a lot of people don't understand what modernism is, but modernism had a lot of different tenets. The modernists, will, uh, some of them will hold that, um, they're, it's kind of agnosticism. We can't know God, or a watering down of our, 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 what we believe as Catholics that, that, you know, the miracles and prophecies, the surest signs of the divine origin of Christianity, we don't know if those things really happened. And the idea that dogmas change with the times, that what we believed in the first, second, and third century, now in the more modern times, those teachings could have changed or evolved or mutated to something else called dogmatic relativism. Pope St. Pius X condemned that. With regard to sacred scripture, the modernists question question things that are clearly taught by divine revelation and scripture. We had some modernists uh, come here one time. I remember I was a seminarian, and we were talking about so many different things, and I was just amazed. So we, I mentioned about Adam and Eve, and they laughed. You believe in Adam and Eve? Oh, we know better now. It wasn't a, a one man and one woman. They were tribes. Of course they were tribes. And you know, they, they, they expounded as if they were there and they saw it. So I said, so how do you prove, contrary to the clear words of scripture, that they were tribes? Oh, you gotta read between the lines. There's nothing between the lines. You, you know, uh, it's interesting. Saint, Pius X, Saint. He compared the modernist mind to a bladder. It's full of a lot of waste. You, could, you, can, you can imagine the anger of Pope St. Pius X to the modernist. These men who are so uneducated, but are, they think they're so enlightened now, they come up with things that are totally subjective, no proof, just totally imaginary, as if this is the fact now, this is it. Almost like the evolutionist. You know that there's evolution and we evolve from a lower species to a higher species. There's no proof for it. There's no evidence of it. We don't see people today in the, in the zoo all of a sudden turn into human beings. It's, there's no record of it anywhere in the history of mankind as far back as we can go. Oh, but it's a slow process. Well, it's a slow process and we've already come through this process. Why is it happening today? There's nothing there. But again, back to St. Pius X and, 
what the, you know, the idea that these modernists, that they're so enlightened, this is absurd. I, uh, I like to use this with my students when we're teaching theology class. We have the 13 volumes of St. John Damasus. These books are this thick. You open up the page, left column is in Latin, right column is in Greek. Very tiny, tiny, tiny writing. So I had to look up something on a particular issue pertaining to some crazy interpretation what this Protestant had come up with. And I think, what, what St. John goes off some thought. He, and we're talking about, what was he in the 300s? We're talking about like 16, 1700 years ago. St. John Chrysostom answered this question very thoroughly with quote after quote after quote. So I'm just kind of highlighting this and putting asterisks and I photocopied it because I had to give it to somebody. And I was translating from the Latin. This is what it's saying. This matter that he, this Protestant is coming up with was refuted 1,600 years ago. But when they saw the book, they're like, whoa, this guy was smart. St. Thomas Aquinas had the entire Bible memorized from Genesis to Apocalypse. And they got these modernists to say, you know, they're just so smart, which is absurd. Now, after St. Pius X, we're going to write up here, we're kind of run out of space, but we have Pope Pius the 11th. Now, he wrote many good, great things, but one of the wonderful things is Mortalium Animos. Mortalium Animos, he's actually explicitly condemning false ecumenism. He talks about true ecumenism and false ecumenism. True ecumenism is where the Catholic Church seeks to convert the world to Christ. Go teach all nations, baptizing them, converting everyone to Christ. And he identifies false ecumenism, the idea that we need to recognize everyone. All religions are more or less good and praiseworthy. We all need to just get together and share the quote unquote truth all together. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I wanted to share one thing with you, co outs on my mind, because uh, I got a lot of things to say and I forget very easily. But I wanted to share with you one thing here. And what I like most importantly to do is I like to take things right from secular source so that, or, or Vatican II sources, right from the direct source so that people say, oh, you made that up, or where did you come up with that? So this is our Sunday visitor, the Pope Speaks. And I'm going to read to you right from John Paul II. This is September 9th, 1998, and this was, this was published in 1999. In Nostra Aetate, the Declaration of the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions, the Second Vatican Council teaches that the Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. What religions are they talking about? They mention by name the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims, continuing from his thing here quoting from Vatican II. She has a high regard for the manner of life and conduct, the precepts and doctrines, which although differing in many ways from her own teaching, nevertheless often reflect a ray of that truth that enlightens all men. He goes on and says, it must be kept in mind that every quest of the human spirit for truth and goodness in the last, last analysis for God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The various religions arose precisely from this primordial human openness to God. At their origins, we find often their founders who, with the help of God's spirit, achieved the deep religious experience handed down to others. This experience took the form of doctrines, rites, and precepts of the various religions. What is he saying? The Holy Spirit assisted the founders of the religions of the world. He says, we experience this, especially at Assisi, the World Day of Peace, Prayer for Peace, in October 27, 1986. He assembled all the religions of the world to pray to their false gods for world peace. He writes, the Holy Spirit is not only present in other religions, the Holy Spirit's presence and activity affect not only individuals, but also society, history, peoples, cultures, and religions. So what is amazing is 
when Pope Pius XI and Mortali Manimos condemned false communism, he used the term abandoning the religion revealed by God, apostasy. This, of all the encyclicals, I mean, they're all great. Syllabus of Error is great. Uh, Apostasy Curie, Pascendi. But this especially hits at the heart of the errors of Vatican II, false ecumenism. Pope Pius XI says, God is revealed through Christ, the one true religion. And man has an obligation to recognize that one true religion and do it God's way not to make up his own religion, etc. I remember there was a radio program where these priests would answer uh, on the radio, Rumble and Cardi, how many have heard of them? They got their booklets and stuff like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, there's a debate that went on back and forth between a Protestant minister and one of these priests. And the priest, after they're getting nowhere, he said, wait a minute, just li 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 listen. He said, you worship God the way you want, and I'll worship God the way he wants. Okay, we'll get that straight. I'm going to do it God's way. You could do it your way, okay? Is that, that's what we're basically saying. No, if God is revealed, and he has through Christ, how he's to be worshipped in the faith and all, it's not for man to try to say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to worship God the way he wants. I'm going to worship God, and I'm going to make up my own God. This is all condemned by Pope Pius XI, Mortali Manimos. These are all sold at the bookstore. And if you use my name, you get a discount. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Sister's saying, uh-uh. <laughs> OK, so we also have Pope Pius XII. Mystici Corporis Christi. He wrote an encyclical on the church. And the beautiful thing is that he said, the Catholic Church is the one true Church of Christ. Vatican II actually changed that. And they said, the true Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Meaning, it's not identified with the Catholic Church because it goes beyond the Catholic Church. And when Vatican II talks about the people of God, who's the people of God? Anybody out there. So Corpus Christi, uh, Corp Mystici Corpus Christi, excellent encyclical. Also his one on the liturgy, Mediator Dei. So I just want to share with you, it's a wonderful thing when we look at what the church has taught in the past, what the popes have spoken in the past about. We're not abandoned. And we see very starkly how Vatican II has done a, a complete break with the Catholic Church in the past. Dignitatis Humani was condemned by syllabus of error. We have Mortali Manimos, the decree, uh, Vatican II decree on ecumenism, condemned by Mort in Mortali Manimos. The idea of changing the consecration of bishops, the form, rendering it ambiguous, we have Apostolic Curie. And I don't want to forget Pope Pius XII again. And this was in Sacramentum Ordinis. So a controversy occurred amongst theologians at the time of Pope Pius XII. And that was with regard to the matter and the form for ordination of deacons, priests, and bishops. What's the matter? What's the form? And the whole issue was really began with The Council of Florence mentioned as the matter being the, the Traditio Instrumentorum, the handing over the instruments that for the priesthood, the bishop will have a chalice with water and a little bit of wine and on the patent the host, and he'll hand it to the ordinandi, and, and they touch it, and he says, receive the power to offer the sacrifice of the, the mass of, for the living and the dead, Etc. So it's interesting in the Latin rite, this is found, this, this ceremony is found, but not in the Eastern Catholic rites. All, both rites have the imposition of hands and the form, the words. And so the question came up about 
to Pope Pius XII was either the Eastern Rites do not have valid orders or the Council of Florence has erred in this matter. Pope Pius XII very wonderfully explained the Catholic Church has always recognized the validity of the Greek Catholic rites. And even though they don't have the handing over the instruments, he said, even according to the mind of the Council of Florence, this is not required for validity because the Catholic Church at the Council of Florence knew they did not have this ceremony. But he says, if it was ever required as an additional aspect for validity, what the church has, has, uh, ins has instituted, the church can also abrogate. And so Pope Pius XII said, from now on, uh, this, this ceremony is to be still observed, but the matter is the imposition of hands and the form, and he gave exactly the forms for the diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopacy, the exact forms. So here comes Paul VI, like 20 years later, and changes the form for the consecration of bishops. Paul VI comes along when the Novus Ordo first came out, and he changed the words of consecration from the for many, pro multis, to for all, for all men. Now we know after so many years when so many of the older priests died out, and a lot of these younger priests were not validly ordained, Benedict said, oh, we're going to go back to the original pro for the many, but they accomplished what they wanted to, to destroy the means of grace. So I like to, having read or written these things down, I like to just kind of identify very quickly what were the spiritual cancers that the modernists, the Masons, injected into the church to try to destroy the church from within. As you know, with cancer, you don't need a lot, just a few cells, and once it starts to spread, it does its destructive work. So if people were to ask you, what, were, what are the issues now? What is the issue? So with regard to the Vatican II, modern church, big issue is religious indifferentism. And then Nostra Aetate, when they said the Catholic Church looks with esteem upon the Muslims. The Muslims don't believe in the divinity of Christ. They deny the Trinity. The church has never looked with the same on them. The church prays in the Hindus, where they, they worship false gods. And the idea that we should acknowledge, preserve, and promote the good in these other religions, what good is there in worshiping a false god? This is against the first commandment of God. So religious and differentism, number one, false ecumenism, that we should all get together and worship together and all just get along. These are the, the, the main aspects of the cancer that's been injected within the church. Religion differentism, false communism, and also religious liberty. Man has the right to worship God any way he wants. And this Dignitatis Humanae said, even if a man goes against his conscience, even if he doesn't seek the truth, even if he seeks error, he has the right to proselytize and spread his errors and all that. Now, as we know, we've just mentioned that these things are not only against the first commandment, but we also have, it goes even further now with Francis. I'm sure many of this is old hat we talked about last year. Francis gave an apostolic exhortation com, called Amoris Laetitia. And in this, he talks about how those who are living in adultery can be given Holy Communion. I mean, blatantly against the Sixth Commandment. Francis has said, you know, who am I to judge about these, you know, homosexual unions? And, you know, we've got to treat them with charity and pastoral kindness and all this other stuff. No, sin is sin. If you love the sinner, you want them to convert and not go to hell and die in their sin. So we have clearly against the Sixth Commandment. Because when you say that adulterers can go to Holy Communion, you're basically authorizing sacrilege. And all a part of this, too, we have the new code of canon law.
promulgated by John Paul II, 1983, is Canon 8, uh, 844, authorizing that you can give communion to non-Catholics, to Protestants and to schismatics, authorizing sacrilege. The traditional code of 1917 said it's forbidden, forbidden to administer the sacraments to heretics and schismatics, even if they ask in good faith. They have to first abjure their error and come back to the church. That's Canon 731. So we have black and white contradiction. This Vatican II modern church, Christ is not with this church. The Holy Ghost is not present. Otherwise, we'd have to say the Holy Ghost has failed the church. Christ has failed the church, which is blasphemy. What we're witnessing today is nothing other than the apostasy spoken of by St. Paul to his letter to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Now what's interesting about the Second Thessalonians, I know we're doing this very quickly, is that he talks about the mystery iniquity is already at work, provided only that he who at present restrains does restrain till he's gotten out of the way, then the wicked one will be revealed. Who is the one down through the centuries, even to St. Paul's time, who is restraining the mystery of iniquity? It's the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, the rock upon which Christ founded his church until he's gotten out of the way. What the Masons said they were gonna do, they did. They're gonna destroy the church from within, they're gonna infiltrate within, they're gonna get their own man on the throne of Peter, and they're gonna destroy people's faith. So we were mentioning before, isn't it sad what's going on in our country, but it's even more tragic to know what's going on, what has gone on and what is going on to destroy the church. I, I, I can't get away from, I'm, I'm very happy. I actually, you know, when you get something really good, you laminate it. You don't want to keep it for a long time. You don't want to give it away. But I, I, I like to use this for recent converts. So this is Time Magazine, December 12th, 1969. We've talked about this before, but I, this would be really good. Just if you have any relatives are saying, well, what is going on in the church? This tells you. Liberating the Greg. So it's talking about the Gregorian Institute. It's a pontifical Gregorian university established by St. Ignatius of Loyola in 1551. This university, the alumni, 15 became popes, eight became saints, 33 beatified, 30 to 40 of its alumni become bishops every year. So they talk about how in the, you know, the standards of the world, this is a secular Time magazine saying, you know, these seminarians had no life of their own. They had classes, they had to wear cassocks, they couldn't go out to the bars in, in, in Rome, they couldn't go to movie theaters, et cetera, et cetera. They had very good restrictions. That all changed. And this article talks about how Paul VI took out the conservative cardinal, Giuseppe Pizzardo, and replaced him with this Canadian-born sociologist, Hervé Carrier. What was this first thing with the seminary? Make it co-ed. So they, put, they brought in 198 women into the seminary. And then for discipline, the seminarians no longer had to wear a cassock. They could wear just regular lay clothes. So far as discipline is concerned, you don't have to worry about going to a tavern because they set up a bar in the seminary. And then it goes on to say, with regard to the movie, movies shown at seminary, they were showing pornography. And then for the professors, they were inviting Protestant professors to come in. Even a Jewish rabbi was gonna come and give classes. I mean, this is blatantly undermining and destroying what used to be once a Catholic seminary, Jesuit seminary. I don't know if you ever read this. <clears throat> I was reading this about two, three years ago. But the superior general of the Jesuits, he didn't believe that Satan existed. Very interesting. This man is in charge of all the Jesuits of the world. He didn't even know if Satan exists. What kind of nonsense is this? But I want to get back to, it's tragic what's happening in our country. It's what's even more tragic what happened in the church. I go back to my old neighborhood, south side of Chicago. We had, in our school, 
We had 1,000 kids in our grade school, 1,000. It was second grade to eighth grade, 1,000 kids. We had 500 families in that church. And we were very close to other churches. We were seven holy founders, Servite Order, priests and religious sisters. About a mile or so away was St. Isidore's. They had a school. They had St. Peter and Paul. They had a school there. The, the, the whole area of Chicago, we had like over two million Catholics. You go back there, closed, 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 closed. These beautiful, flourishing churches, schools, seminaries, convents, gone. Absolutely, positively gone. Our Lord said, by their fruits you should know them. The fruits of Vatican II have been nothing but a disaster. And they're, they're out to destroy the church. So I, I want to, I know all of you heard these things before. Some of you are new, some of you are old timers. And I'm not pointing any old timers like, oh, you're an old timer. If you're, if, you're, if you're older than me, you're an old timer, okay? Just want to say that. But getting back to the reality, this is the apostasy. And if there was a true pope today, he would be warning about the evils in our society, the evils within the church. No, these false popes are aiding and abetting the heretics within the church, because they're heretics themselves, and they're aiding and abetting what I would call the New World Order, the Great Reset. They're part and parcel with this whole movement. You know, if you look at what Francis says when he talks about important issues, saving the environment, saving the world, the, the, world, the climate change, all, all this nonsense. What about souls going to hell and all this other stuff? No, that don't matter. I remember when he came out with one of his encyclicals on like a social economic things, Rush Limbaugh, the famous talk show host, he said, this is, this is socialist, this is communist. And here's a secular talk show host recognizing what Francis is promoting. So where does it leave us today? Well, it leaves us today that I'd like to say Christ promised the gates of hell will not prevail. They're absolutely true. To me, it's a wonder when I look back over the last so many years where we're at today. If you know where we came from and where we're at today, it's like, thank you, Blessed Mother. By, by your intercession, we've not only persevered, but things have grown and, and there are souls being saved. The church is flourishing, not as big as it was in the past. And Satan hates that. So he'd like nothing more to destroy the remnant Catholic faithful. So I wanted to share a couple of things with you. Uh, these are kind of random things, but I, I, I don't want to forget. But God rest his soul, Archbishop Took. There are some traditional Catholics who made up their mind a long time ago that they did not want to have anything to do with the Took bishops, the Took clergy. And so they came up with this erroneous rumor that, oh, Archbishop Took was insane. He was out of his mind. He was senile. He didn't know what he was doing. So I'd like to kind of spell out some of these things one point after another. First of all, I just want to share with you, Archbishop Took wrote an autobiography, Misericordias Domine Eternum Cantabo. He wrote this in French. It has, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 80, 86 pages in French. And I know, because I've seen his handwriting before, Archbishop Took's handwriting, so this is back, we typed this out back in the 80s when we didn't have like the computers, but the Delete, delete, delete. I don't know if they even had liquid paper back then. So you might have a, you might have a, a line crossed out with some writing, but Archbishop took 86-page autobiography, great detail. Interestingly, too, Archbishop took, after he had consecrated Bishop Gerard de Laurier, Bishop Zaboran, Bishop Carmona, and these men were nobody's fool. They were well-instructed, well-established, older Catholic clergy who knew the faith. Bishop Carmona told me personally, this is 1987, I flew down to Mexico because of these, some of the rumors were hitting back in the 80s that Archbishop took used the new right, or he didn't do this or do that. Bishop Carmona told me, I don't know who these people are saying this, but he says, I was happy to be there. I got consecrated. 
I had the pontifical right in my hand. He followed exactly according to what was in the pontifical. After the pontifical, after the, I should say, after the consecration and following the pontifical and consecrating these bishops, a year later, Archbishop Took made a declaration. So there's a picture in this booklet here of him actually, you saw we had a pontifical mass upstairs. Do you think somebody seeing now could do that? I hope you don't think I'm seeing it, okay? <laughs> I'll, really, I'll just bounce around up there to piece, push them this way, push them that way. Read that, say that. Okay, you know. So we have Archbishop Took at a pontifical mass. I believe it's in Munich. He's reading in Latin as a declaration. This is a year after he did the consecrations. And I have to tell you this about his, his declaration. His declaration was written in Latin, handwritten in Latin. And also he gives the references. And the references are extremely detailed. So he, he writes in Latin that he joins to this document the titles of his references. He talks about the bull quo primum of Pius V, the Council of Trent, session 22, Adorabile Eucharistiae of Pius VII, and the Council of Florence, the decree to the Arminians, the, the, the decree to the Jacobites. He gives the Denginger, remember we talked about the source of Catholic dogma, Denginger, he gives the numbers exactly how you find these, these sections in there. Basali Romanum, De Defectibus, uh, in the De Defectibus uh, Formi, the Constitution of Pius VI, Octorum Fidei, Lamentabile Impescendi of Pope Pius, St. Pius X, the Decree of uh, Council of Florence, Quanta Cura of Pope Pius IX, the Bull Unam Sanctum of Boniface VIII, the Code of Canon Law 1322, the Bull Cum Ex Apostolatus Officio of Paul IV the and the Code of Canon Law, Canon 188, number 4. Then he also quotes from the Pontificale Romanum from the consecration of, of bishops. And he signs it in great detail. I also have here Bishop Carmona, his uh, certificate or his letter of consecration. Once again, I have the original. Perfect Latin, and writes his consecration of Bishop Carmona. It's kind of interesting, one of the clergy who did not want to accept the Took consecrations is saying, well, Took never wrote anything to acknowledge that. We got it right here. It's in perfect Latin. I have, when Bishop Carmona died, I have his file where Archbishop Took and Bishop Carmona were exchanging letters in Latin. This is well after the consecration. I think you've heard uh, before in the past conferences, Father Francis Miller, he lived with Archbishop Took in Rochester, New York, when Archbishop Took was a Franciscans there. Archbishop Took, he taught Latin to the seminarians. He heard confessions, he offered mass. He was receiving visitors to people. In fact, I, I have to laugh, Father uh, Thomas Fui, God rest his soul, I don't know, who was he, 99 when he died, something like that, pretty old. He was from New Zealand. When he first met Archbishop Took, he said, you were at the Eucharistic Congress in, in New Zealand back in 1930-something. Back in, he says, that was, a, and Father Fui said, in Auckland. And Father Archbishop Took said, I was there, but it wasn't in Auckland, it was in Wellington. He corrected Father Fui that it was in Wellington, not Auckland. And, and, and you know, to say that this man's a senile or he doesn't know what he's doing or doesn't, that's just ridiculous. Archbishop Took was in Louisiana. He was speaking in French because Vietnam was a, you know, a colony of France. So he knew French. He was speaking in French to the Cajuns in Louisiana. He's, he knew enough Italian that he could talk to the people that were Spanish speaking, talking Italian. Talking to one of the priests, he was talking Vietnamese. Not bad for a guy that's supposed to be senile. It's totally a fraud. It's a complete and absolute lie that he was seen now or anything else like that. But you know, people hear this rumor and they, oh, it's a matter of fact, we know he was crazy and, and we can't trust any of the validity of those consecrations or whatever because he was a crazy man and he was dementia and all that. It's a total, total lie, N nothing of the truth. I want to also share with you another issue and that is with regard to, while we're at it, you know that our priests can't be everywhere and can't reach everyone, but it pertains to baptism. I know we're kind of going off into things, but these are topics that I wanted to make sure I get in before we forget. 
So baptism. When, uh, when can you do a baptism? In an emergency. So if there is a danger of death, anyone can baptize. The important thing is remember you have to have simultaneity. At the, as the water is flowing over the skin, you're saying the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. When it comes to an infant who does not have the use of reason, you just absolutely do it. No question. Infant in danger of baptism, baptize. And for those of you grandmas out there, if you have any of your children who are not living the faith, do not baptize them secretly. Now I'm looking for some grandmas to go, what? If anyone brings children to our priest to be baptized and they're not practicing the faith, we have to have a moral certainty that they're going to be raised in the Catholic faith. We're not to, it's not to blame the kid, but we have to have that guarantee they're going to actually be raised in the Catholic faith before we baptize them. And so unless there's a danger of death, don't baptize the infant. And this what pertains to infants and danger of death, I would also say too, if somebody is mentally handicapped for the rest of their life, they'll never have the development of their, their mind to an adulthood, I'd baptize them because that would be their, their ticket to heaven. Now, it's a little bit different when it comes to adults. Now, let's say you come across a, 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 an accident. Somebody's dying on the side of the road. What do you do? If they can communicate and talk, you can maybe say a prayer with them, of course. If they're not baptized, they have to at least believe these four things for an adult in an emergency. They have to believe that God exists. They have to believe that God rewards and punishes in the next life. They have to believe that there are three divine persons and one God, the Blessed Trinity. And they have to also believe in the incarnation that the Son of God became man. Those four points they have to believe. Now, let's say you're really fortunate. You just came back from the center, and you bought a catechism. My Catholic faith, and oh boy, in pictures too. And you come across an accident, and you're trying to go as fast as you can. Now, hang in there, boy. We're on, we're on page 102. You know, <laughs> they don't got the time. He's going to die. We need to baptize him now. So we have to finish sacramentals. Or we have to finish the 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 the. the Laws of the church or abstinence, and they don't got time for that. You're dying, okay? So in an emergency, they have to at least believe this. And then added to this, they should make an act of contrition. They should have sorrow for their, their sins. Because that baptism will remit their sins, but they have to be sorry for their, their sins. Excuse me. And if they have that, you can help them get to heaven. I got to share a quick story with you. This is pretty cool. One of our priests, Father uh, Troff in Alabama, he was called on a sick call and uh, didn't know who the lady was, but she lays in the hospital and the hospital called and they got Father's number. So he went down there. The lady was not baptized. He baptized her. He gave her the sacraments, et cetera, et cetera. And she was awake. She was conscious of what was going on. Later on, she died. Father didn't hear anything from her. I'm thinking maybe about eight months later, he gets a letter from a lawyer saying, oh, by the way, we're, we're dealing with her estate. And she uh, is allotting some of her estate to her church. So Father called me up and says, what do I do? Because she didn't go to this church. I will tell the lawyer that. OK. So he calls the lawyer and says, you know, I want to be honest. She never went to this church, by the way. And uh, the lawyer said, well, as far as we know, we don't know what church she even went to a church, so you are the church. So uh, maybe uh, three months ago, Father calls me up and says, I'm not going to believe this. I believe what? A letter from the lawyer. Remember that, that lady that passed away, the estate? I said, yeah. 
first installment, $80,000. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so I was telling the priest at the priest meeting, you know, one of the things, this is one of the opinions out there. You know, there's a lot of different groups, traditional groups, and they do different things. And there's one particular group that said that they're not going to be going on sick calls to anyone who's part of the Novus Ordo Church. They're not going to do it because they got other things to do, and if, if, if they're not traditional Catholics, we're not going to, whatever. And, and my attitude is this. I would wager to say that I think most people who are part of the modern church, go to the Novus Ordo, they've been deceived. They want to be Catholic. And as priests, we have the obligation to administer the sacraments to them. And that's why we're ordained to the priesthood to save souls. And how many of the people that are dying today, I mean, I barely remember Latin Mass, and I'll be 65 at the end of this month. People younger than me would have no remembrance of Latin Mass. But they were baptized, they want to be Catholic, and they don't know any better. We should try to reach out and be ready for helping all of them. We talked about this at our priest meeting. But this brings up another topic, and that is the topic of jurisdiction. Before I get off this topic, I want to say this. Getting back to baptism, there has been a little bit of a controversy about novus ordo baptisms. Now, have there been crazy things going on with the novus ordo baptism? Yes, there has been. Uh, there was a case, I believe, in Arizona where the modernist priest was saying, we baptize you. And even the modern church recognized that was not valid. They had to go back and find out all those baptisms that he did. Or not pouring the water flowing over the head. Or and submerging them, not submerging the head also, just maybe the back part of the baby. So there have been cases like that, but what is the mind of the church? What does the Catholic Church teach about baptism? First of all, anybody can baptize. And as long as they pour the water, say the right words, and at least have the general intention of doing what Christ intended or doing what the Catholic Church intends, it's valid. Even an atheist in a hospital, like an atheist nurse or doctor, if the woman had a baby and she says, please, the baby's dying, please baptize my baby, even they who have no faith could baptize that baby, as long as they have matter, form, and intention. But there, the controversy is that somebody has come up with the idea that it has to be 1990. From 1990 on, we should doubt all baptisms of novus ordos, and we have to do them all over again, at least conditionally. Our practice is, if there is a positive doubt, that's what the church teaches, then we would conditionally baptize. If there's any doubt with regard to baptism, and, and there is, if there's really a doubt, we should look into it and we should baptize conditionally. But if there is no doubt, we don't just randomly say we're going to do everybody. But getting back to the issue of jurisdiction, so I wanted to briefly touch on, upon that because that's one of the questions, where is jurisdiction today and where did you get your jurisdiction and all this other good stuff. So, um, the word jurisdiction... <laughs> comes from two Latin words, to speak the law. So jurisdiction really means authority. It's in canon law, it's the teaching of the church that there are three types of jurisdiction. There's ordinary jurisdiction. That comes from an office. When you have a position or office in the church, you have ordinary jurisdiction attached to the office. So. to an office within the church. If you're a bishop of a diocese or a pastor of a parish, okay, now then, those who have ordinary jurisdiction, they can give it to someone else, they can delegate it. Given. And then lastly, there's what we call supply jurisdiction. Supply jurisdiction is for the good of the church. It's interesting how this all came about, this concept. 
it's interesting how some of our laws in canon law were basically taken from Roman practice. So it is a part of Roman history that a certain Roman man, I forget his name, he escaped from being a slave, put on some good clothes, shaved his, you know, kind of spruced himself up and started living in society like he was a free man. And he got chosen to be a judge. So he's there, judge, making all these decisions. And about a year later, he said, wait a minute. He's a, he was a slave. He escaped. He's not a free man. He's a slave. And according to Roman law, slaves could not have any position within you know, the Roman uh, government. So then the question came up, what do you do about all his acts? He was acting as judge. They said, for the good of the Roman government and for good of society, decisions he made are going to stand. Now, with regard to supply jurisdiction, this is a matter of moral theology and also canon law. The church makes the distinction between ministers. So you have ministers who have what's called the cure of souls. And they are like pastors, and it enumerates who they are. Then there's ministers who do not, who do, do not have the cure of souls. Non-pastors. So what it says in the area of moral theology, the obligation of the pastor to administer the sacraments. Those who have the cure of souls, they have an obligation and justice to administer the sacraments. They're bound under sin, serious sin, injustice because they are paid to be the pastor, they're supported, they have to administer the sacraments. Those who do not have the cure of souls, they are bound in charity to administer the sacraments, especially in times where there's no pastors available. And we're talking about normal times. So the concept of the church supplying jurisdiction for the good of souls, this is not something made up. This is something right within the teachings of the church, moral theology, canon law. Now, I, I have to thank, there is a fellow I met, and he's from Turin, Italy, Stefano Filiberto. He has a doctorate in ecclesiastical history. And I read an article in Italian, and he was talking about the consecration of bishops without a papal mandate. So he did his homework. He has access, he has the license to get into the Vatican and look up many, many things that the average person would not be allowed to do. And so he talks about how between the death of Pope Clement the Fourth. And this was November 29th, 1268. And the election of Blessed Gregory the 10th September 1st, 1271. There's almost three years of an interregnum where there's no pope. 21 bishops were consecrated without papal mandate. These 21 bishops were to fulfill empty dioceses. Now, there was no pope. Ordinarily, the pope issues the mandate, the command for the man to be consecrated bishop, and the jurisdiction comes from the pope. But when there is no pope, the church supplies these bishops with jurisdiction. I have another thing in this article that I wrote, and this is with regard to the Great Western Schism, when there were three men claiming to be Pope. Very lengthy article that was written in De Ecclesia Christi of this Jesuit by the name of Father Timothy Zappanilena in 1946. He talks about how all jurisdiction comes from the Pope to the bishops and throughout the church. But then he poses some questions like, well, if, if what you're saying is true, what happened during the time of Western Schism? There were three men claiming to be Pope. And there were some of the opinion that none of the three were Pope. We said, even if you suppose that none of them were Pope, Christ himself would have supplied jurisdiction to all three different groups. Because the Catholic Church must always fulfill the mission of the Church, 
for the salvation of souls. So this is not something invented. This is something that the church teaches. So do I consider myself having ordinary jurisdiction? No. I'm not the bishop of Omaha, the diocese of Archdiocese of Omaha, no. But I'm a Catholic bishop, validly consecrated, and I believe the church supplies jurisdiction just like those 21 bishops during the time of this interregnum. This is not invention. This is what the church has done in the past. In fact, if you look up different theology books, there's one by a, a Monsignor Charles Journet. He talks about the consecration of bishops during the vacancy of the apostolic see and how they function, and it was all legitimate. I mean, this is not make-believe. This is actual fact, historical fact, precedent already made. I want to just share one last thing with you. I know we're getting right up to the... I'm not sure when it's supposed to end this talk, but it ends when I turn off the microphone or when they turn it off for me, or when they start turning off the lights, maybe. Or... But that is with regard to what I want to say, theological opinion. There are areas of dogmatic theology or moral theology where the Catholic Church has not made a definitive decision one way or the other. We have the example of the Immaculate Conception before Pope Pius the IX in 1854 declared it a dogma. The Immaculate Conception, the Franciscans held to the Immaculate Conception. The Dominicans did not. And they argued amongst themselves about this. This is a very interesting controversy. And it was settled by Pope Pius IX. But prior to that, there are two different opinions. We have a, a, a difference of opinion between Simon Thomas Aquinas on the words of consecration, what constitutes words of consecration, and also St. Bonaventure. One's a Dominican, and one is a Franciscan. So difference of opinion, yes. We have a difference of opinion between the, the Rhoda, this is the matrimonial court in Rome, and also the Holy Office. Two different offices under the Pope having a difference of opinion on Canon 1068. Two different of opinion. They didn't agree with each other. I, I'll give you one classic example of a difference of opinion in moral theology. This is interesting. So here is Father Kazmir's car right here, okay? And here's Father Philip's car. Okay, so let's say Father Philip gives a really long, boring sermon. And someone is ripping mad. I'm going to get back at Father Philip for that long, boring sermon. I don't believe he gives long sermons. I don't give, believe he gives boring sermons. But I'm just... As a, as a matter of story, okay? So someone's going to get back at Father Philip, so he sneaks down in the middle of the night, goes down to the rectory down there, and unbeknownst to him, he wrecks Father Casimir's car. He wanted to wreck Father Philip's car, but he wrecked Father Casimir's car. Now, obviously, he committed a sin. He broke the seventh commandment, unjust damage to property. Now, as a matter of restitution, there are two different opinions about restitution. They write out of moral theology. Some theologians say, it doesn't matter whose car he wrecked. He wrecked somebody's car, and he has to pay it. So he has to pay or make restitution to Father Kasmer. Other theologians say, no. He had no intention of damaging Father Kasmer's car. He committed a sin. He had committed a sin, but he doesn't have to make restitution because he had no intention of, of damaging Father Kazmir's car. Maybe he likes Father Kazmir. He loves his sermons. He would have never damaged the car. Do I know something interesting about this? St. Thomas, or excuse me, St. Alphonsus Liguori, doctor of the church, holds that opinion that if there's no intention of damaging Father Kazmir's car, he doesn't have to make restitution. Now, whenever I give the story, I tell the kids, Bishop's car and Father So-and-so's car. And I say, you better, I don't care what your opinion is, you better fix my car. 
because I'll come after you, okay? So I mean, it gives an idea that there are differences of opinion. And the important thing in this day and age is, is this. If something doesn't accept or go with your opinion, it's not the end of the world. We don't all of a sudden condemn them. Oh, don't go to their mass, don't go to their sacraments, or they didn't agree with me, and blah, blah, blah. There was a recent, this past year, maybe it was a year, a little bit a little over a year ago, but some young fella who, uh, he must he visited Mount, maybe I don't know how many years ago, but he talked about this, uh, he disagreed with CMRI on some points, so he said, we're not serious, and that no one should go to CMRI. And I wrote to him a public letter, because his letter was public, and I just said, I think this is preposterous. I said, you, by your own admission, recognize CMRI is the biggest traditional state of your contest group in the world, and you're, you're a lay person telling people, don't go to their sacraments, don't go to their mass, because they're not serious. I said, that is totally, absolutely, positively irresponsible. Now, I want to just end on this. Am I supposed to end pretty soon? Can somebody tell me? Are we going over time for too long or no? We're good? How far, how far over are we? OK, not a big sin yet. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you know, we're talking about the gates of hell not prevail. Honestly, by the grace of God, if you know where we came from, the humble beginnings we came from, it's, it's, it's amazing what God's grace, what our Blessed Mother's intercession has done. So last night, I was kind of kicking around what I was going to say, and I said, you know, how many priests, how many religious are working together with us? So I counted them, different priests, religious or secular, how many religious, different convents, uh, whatever. We have 219 priests, religious seminarians. We didn't even count the seminarians from the minor seminary. Sorry if we didn't count you. How many are there anyway? How many, Father? 12. So we do our math. It's 231 altogether, counting the minor seminarians. So, by the grace of God, and we're only, we're not the Catholic Church. The Church is bigger than just us, and we recognize that, and we can't be everywhere. But by the grace of God, we're doing what we can, and I do have to uh, extend my appreciation to the priests and religious and everybody who works so hard to make things work. And uh, it, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I like to, I like to be facetious to keep people's morale up, and so, one of our younger priests, I won't mention Father uh, Sanquist's name, I, oh, I just did, but he, he, he uh, sometimes when he tries to coordinate things, I tell him, like, oh, I'm not going to do that. So we need to do a, a minor readjustment of where the priests go, because we're covering multiple places. Every Sunday, I have three masses, drive six hours, the other priests drive 16 hours, this and that, whatever else. And when somebody gets sick or they have something else to do, we have a lot of rearranging to do. So he called up this priest, and this priest would have to drive on a Sunday. He'd have to put in like 15 hours of driving to cover this one place. I'm like, Father, that's, uh, don't burn them out. We could, let me, let's figure this out again. So we, we, I said, look, we're going to get together, and we're going to coordinate all our activities together so we know where we're going, and you know, all priests show up at one spot at the same time. But... I was teasing to him, so I said, Father, before you call Father Krisoff in Moscow to cover a church or mass center in central Nebraska, before you do that, <laughs> we want to make sure we're organizing ourselves. By the way, when Father Krisoff has come, it's taken like 36 hours to get here. But I told him, I don't know about Father Sanquist. He might try to arrange that, you know. It's like, <laughs> hey, Father Krisoff, can you drive th or come 36 hours to cover this mass here? No, we're not going to do that. I'm just teasing. Uh, Father Frank was a very good priest, works very hard, but I just have to laugh. Some of the things we've coordinated are like, ah, don't, don't ask the priest for doing too much. When we read them, when we really need it, we'll ask them for it, but if you ask on too many occasions, they're going to tell us no. And you know, so when our priests come, or we have priests substitute for us, tell the sisters, cook them a real good meal, good, a good, good steak, you know, and like, you know, roll out the red carpet, make them feel welcome, and, and, and then some. But really, we're not trying to bribe the priests, etc. It's just a matter of that. 
our priests do a lot of work, sisters do a lot of work, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to see where we came from and where we're at today by the grace of God and our Blessed Mother. And I also want to say this on ending. You know, I don't know what the future has in store for our country. It doesn't look good. But I can also say this, that I, I, am, I am certainly apprehensive because Satan knows the good that's being done to souls that are being saved. He like nothing to do but shut us down. And they could create something, like create lawsuits or this or that against us just to cause trouble, just to drain us of our funds, just to, uh, I would just say, try to stop the work that we're doing. You, hear, you heard this Colorado baker? I mean, he has been sued and sued and sued and sued, and what they're doing is they're draining him his money and his time, going after him one time after another after another. And why? Because he's trying to practice his faith and not condone same gender unions. And boy, they've targeted him. They're going to have one suit lawsuit after another, just to tie him up in the courts and destroy him uh, financially. And I can foresee that it happening. I find it interesting, I'm sure some of you have seen the interviews with uh, some of the uh, Department of Justice people, and they said they were going to target traditional Catholics. We might have somebody plant in here. I'm not saying don't trust anybody. We have nothing to hide. So, but it's interesting that they would actually say traditional Catholics, those who reject Vatican II, those who go to Latin Mass. I mean, like, whoa. Uh, we're a big threat to them. Don't worry about the terrorists and the drug cartels sending in drugs here. Don't worry about them. But those traditional Catholics, keep an eye on them. So it's important that we pray to Our Lady for perseverance. As we're saying in the sermon, wear Our Lady's brown scapular, pray her rosary, live your total consecration to Mary, to Jesus through Mary, have recourse to Mary's immaculate heart. And in the end, her heart's going to triumph, and her heart is going to be our sole refuge. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. We say the Angelus, please. Ich hab den Job-Job. Auf Stepstone.